Professor Jean Seaton, Professor James Curran, thank you for joining me on Telefriend. So I'll begin by talking about your seminal book, Power Without Responsibility. And for my listeners who may not have come across the text, you argue that the media is dominated by a small number of conglomerates and individuals running the media, and you claim that they're driven by a passion to gain profit. And you also talk about the lack of diversity in content based on um, this need to get profit so companies are more likely to go with what they're safe, what, what's worked in the past. And I wanted to start off by asking, could you tell me what your motivation was in writing that book? If we start with you, Professor Seaton. Let's start with James. Professor Curran. Um, we were asked to underwrite, um, ghostwrite, co-write a book by a very nice politician. Um, and we decided the book was irredeemable. Um, and so we disengaged. And then we thought, well, since we're having a conversation, why we, don't we turn the conversation into a book? So it was completely um, unplanned. But um, that's how it started. But it's, it started. It started, didn't it start because... I mean, it started a very, very long time ago when we were young. So it's that long ago. <laughs> and these things sound obvious now, but it also started because we thought that um, we were surrounded by people who wanted to talk about the content of the media. And we thought that was really interesting. But we also thought that that content was at least in part the product of the way in which the structure of the media industries worked. And although that is obvious now, I think it wasn't quite so obvious then. So I think there was some sense that if you wanted to grapple with the impact of the media, then you needed to understand the drivers of the media industries, as you still do. I mean, you know, you need to understand that Facebook is you know, it's destroying democratic politics everywhere, but it's driven by, it, it, it's not because it's, it has a malign effect and it may have malign people. We don't, you know, but even, but the, the very structure of how it makes money at the moment, unregulated, means that it has, it has particularly, it pursues certain kinds of content. So I think, I think that what, there was accident, but there was also, a sense that you needed to understand the media in a way that was, I think, slightly different from the way in which the nascent media studies around us was That's looking true. at it. Because it was text-based and it was shaped by Inglit and we had a different take. Yeah. Absolutely. And in the book, you took a historical approach looking at the development of media and did you find that this seek to gain profit by these media organizations is something that has happened throughout history or was there a particular turning point that caused this shift? Professor Curry? I think, it, I think it's always been there. Um, but there was a moment in the first half of the 19th century where a new kind of journalism developed and that was driven by politics. And it became a powerful, popular force with a mass audience committed to the advancement of the working class. And that was different from the commercial press. And that's the only moment in history when that kind of press um, had a popular impact. I mean, but I mean, the second bit of the book is about broadcasting, and sure. the, there was an alternative model available in, in Britain. Indeed. Um, and over the time that the book's been around, that model has been deliberately and systematically wrecked in America, and in my view, is under. You know, the most extreme pressure 
that it's been since we wrote the book, really, um, here. And that alternative model, although not perfect, was one of, um, which was embodied in the BBC, rolled out to Channel 4 and in its heyday, LBC, which is back again as a really interesting commentator, out to ITV. That model was one of always imperfect. Everything's always imperfect, but that, that's great. That's, that's just human. Um, can be better, can be worse. Was one of sa saying that broadcasting was such an important new instrument for informing voters and informing and enriching lives that it had to be regulated in the public interest. And although you could have an argument about whether that was about security and how limited that was and whatever, actually the, the principle that this medium ought in some sense be devoted to the interests of the public and be a countervailing force against whoever's in political charge and give a voice to groups and indeed cultures and, you know, the music of and the voices of and the drama and the comedy of. These are all fantastic that represent other things about the UK and that are in, in some very broad sense in the public interest. That's been an enormously important aspect of our public life. And it's been a very important way that may have failed, but anyway, it's a better way of um, dealing with citizens than as mere dupes. And I think that you see the, and it has never been contemptuous of the public. Whereas the press, which James and I disagree about the press, I like reporters. I think we're completely stuffed at the moment because there's no foreign reporting. I think without reporters, good and bad, ones you don't like. So James and I have a different view of that perhaps. But, um, but it's very clear that if you treat the people as simple idiots, you may end up with simple and idiotic decisions. So, so, so to, 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 to summarise um, a response to your question, one alternative was a labour movement, controlled press, and the alternative was a state-sponsored yeah. um, structure that served the public good. And these are the two alternatives that history offers to a commercially driven profit-oriented, power-hungry um, commercial media. And when you both look at the media environment today, do you believe that the British media serves its role as being that fourth estate, or do you think it's losing that ability? Who's going to go first? I mean, very quickly, my take is that um, the press has tended to be a cheerleader for a conservative government. So that's not always true. It's not true now. Part of the press is attacking Cummings. But in general, the market undermines the freedom of the media because of the close relationship between government and um, conservative proprietors. In contrast to public service broadcasting, which notwithstanding its links to the state, is much more independent of government and is much more vigorous in holding government to account, though the extent to which that is true varies over time. So from your response, am I right in believing that you believe the Chomsky argument of the media serving as its role as manufacturing consent? So this close relationship between branches of government and these media conglomerates, do you believe that they're involved in the same system controlling the populace? I'm, 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 it seems to me Chomsky's analysis, though wonderfully insightful, um, is centred on America. 
mm. and he projects a universal account based mm. on the American experience. And what he doesn't take into account is public service broadcasting is a very strong force in Europe and it's a very strong force in Britain and public service broadcasters have a, a large following and they are different from the press. I don't, his, I think... That, I, I, can I just go quickly finish and then I'll stop. Um, his analysis is all power flows from the top downwards. Yep. I don't think um, that's true. Where, whereas um, there's clearly countervailing influences and they have the opportunity to be expressed in public service broadcasting. I mean, I think that um, he also misunderstands. I mean, it's quite an old book. Um, uh, and um, uh, I, I rather like, you know, government messages at the moment. I find it far too simple. Um, I mean, you know, there are great American newspapers and great, there have been great American journalists. Um, and in, in some part of the American press, there has always laid, you know, it's Michael Shudson's book, it, it rove in a com complicated way. It doesn't, you don't have to be a nice person to be a good journalist or, a, or, you, you know, that, 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 the, the, the or ones that I've, you know, that, that are always on the side we are. But I think that part of the American press and has, in a way, Trump has put that into clearer perspective. Um, that does have extraordinary reporting values and public service values, in a sense. And they've been, and we will miss. So, but one of the other things that I think it needs worth saying is that in the last, you know, you could say that one of the things that happened was that broadcasting took over the public information part of newspapers. And newspapers hunted around for something that they could still do. And what they did was turn, as we saw during Leveson, to scandal because it's sold. Um, and there has been, and yet broadcasters often use an agenda which is set by newspapers. So there is a, and of course, I'm talking about now is much more complicated, but um, I mean, it's really weird opening newspapers like the Mail. And there's a government advert now that says, that, you know, uh, uh, what was the one I noticed? You know, fake news is, you know, this is an example of fake news. Well, you know, you've only peddled fake news for the last 50 years, you know. So, so I think, I think it's, um, I think Chomsky uh, was a very useful text to, fight against i think that it's i you know people like murdoch have certainly used a pattern of ownership they've used an upmarket newspaper in which he's really interested and really invests and quite often can be really good you know a down market newspaper so he buys an upmarket newspaper to corral the elite opinion that looks kind of quite good though has areas of temerity about him a down market newspaper like the sun to drive audiences toward the real cash cow, which is, which is the television. But it, the, the key for my case would be the difference between Sky News and Fox News, both news owned by the same proprietor. But Sky News is actually a very good operation here because it's held to this by this public service regulation. Sky News is not Fox News, doesn't have the same agenda. Uh, I think it's been rather better at holding number 10 to account actually than the BBC. But, you know, you don't find Fox News holding Trump to account. So there's something about the political system. And I, 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 I don't think we disagree. Um, the professionalising project in American journalism was the American equivalent of public service broadcasting. Yeah. Yeah. And it was yeah. enabled by large corporations that didn't have dominant shareholders that gave considerable autonomy to managements and journalists. So the pattern of ownership of the American press is different from the personalised, centralised control you get in Britain. Yes. Um, the, 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 the professional project could produce brilliant journalism. I mean, there's a wonderful series of articles in the New York Times looking at the effect of privatisation of medicine in prisons. Utterly brilliant. Um, based on massive amounts of research. Um, 
give him enormous prominence in a great paper. But you also have the paradox of one of the greatest journalism traditions in the world, producing wonderful articles that supported every single war at the outset that America's ever embarked upon That's and is marginalized dissenting opinion. So you've got a very complicated yes. press tradition in America, wonderful at one level, but also, um, it's also producing, following, it's follow, following the stare of the political elite in the state. And Chomsky got onto that. So his case studies illuminated just how in foreign policy, how journalists surrendered their independence um, in, in case studies. So I, 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 I'm not sure we actually disagree. Maybe there's a difference of emphasis. Um, but, you know, American journalism is wonderful at, at, at some level. And it's wonderful because of a, a professionalizing project. And if I backtrack onto the subject mm -hmm. of Murdoch, um, I've spoken with Nick Davies, who has spoken about Murdoch's ability to almost enter Downing Street as he wants. And he seems to have them by the jugular almost. And my question to you is, do you believe that consecutive prime ministers have been complicit in allowing Murdoch and his empire in growing? Yes, obviously. Yes. Um, I mean, the um, Murdoch was given the green light to take over the Times and the Sunday Times. Um, he was given the green light to take monopoly control over satellite broadcasting. Um, politicians, New Labour and Conservatives, were happy to make Murdoch happy, um, provided they, he supported them. And that's been um, well documented by Nick Davis and others. And John I Seaton, James Garner, could. I wanted to. I mean, I think I think Murdoch's. I think Murdoch. There's two things about Murdoch. It's always worth saying he'll die. You know, he'll um, and presumably quite soon. Um, he has. I mean, you know, we are at, at this moment. We're looking about the complete. We're looking at the. If you look at t two very nasty things are happening, is the complete collapse of the. I mean, there's been a lot of the, of the economic model for supporting independent journalism that to some extent has been supplanted at run the edges by something I'm very suspicious of, which is sort of paid for journalism. But, you know, and it's been it's meant that newspapers are, I think, more if you looked at The Guardian, it's peculiarly um, craven around some of its audiences because it can't lose any of them you know i mean the guardian was the great newspaper that stood out against its audience over over uh suez so th 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 that 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 you know i'm and of course facebook and google have just stolen content i mean first they took the content and then they took uh the attention of the readers then they took the advertising, then they took the attention of the readers. And there is a worldwide crisis, I think, I mean, um, in, in how we will produce organisations with sufficient heft and some money, because journalists need paying, everybody needs paying, um, to do the kind of investigative reporting and day-to-day -day reporting that somehow keeps some sort of scrutiny on things. So you're you're talking to us as a moment of unique peril for the thing that we have called journalism. And I can't see I mean you can see other sources during COVID. I can't be the only person that's become an we I now subscribe to The Lancet, which I really uh, recommend. It's beautifully written. It's fantastically well written, The Lancet. But or, just as during Grenfell Tower the 
thing you really needed to look at was construction news because they've been really carrying the prequel to Grenfell Towers. So there are other places where there are there is stuff going on, but the, 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 I'm. I mean, you know, there is no big alternative model to support the scrutiny of power. And we might miss it when it's completely gone. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, the business model supporting journalism, which was advertising, um, yeah. is in the set of collapse. Um, the, the Labour Bureau of Statistics concluded that publishers more than half their workforce between 2002 and 2016. I mean, how dramatic is that? The, the reduction in, in Britain is, is less severe, but nonetheless, um, the business model is in crisis. And the trouble is the alternative hasn't developed um, because most popular newspapers give away their content free. They undermine the business model of the alternative. So the green shoots that would replace a decaying model haven't emerged. Um, the, the most visited websites, news websites in Britain, are all legacy media. Yep. The Huffington Post is no longer amongst the top ten. Um, so th th there's a crisis of the existing institution. There's a failure of an alternative. Um, and we have a problem of public service broadcasting, it seems to me, um, yeah. um, that, that it's very closely connected to the political class um, and um, hasn't been sufficiently connected to the wider public. So if you look at surveys, I mean, the surveys are quite extraordinary in showing Three quarters of the population saying they aren't represented by the media, they're not represented by politicians. Politicians uh, represent the powerful and the rich. Uh, and, and these are consistent polls, uh, an amazing degree of disaffection. And it comes from the right as much as from the left. And there's been a political class that's dominated public service broadcasting that was disconnected from this anger shot by Brexit, um, which it didn't anticipate, shot by Corbyn, which it abhorred, shot by Cummings, which it abhors, um, an establishment tradition that um, is not enabling different groups in society to speak to each other, which that, not public that, service well, broadcasting is going to be true. I think a bit of that is bollocks. I think a bit of that's Go ahead, tell bollocks. me why. why? Um, two reasons. One, one of which is that if you look at local, which is the bubbling up that we need, then clearly the government is in, I mean, you know, the um, Cardiff, um, you know, community journalism showed that all of the government money that was supposed to go into local has gone into reach. Um, yeah. It's gone sure. into Trinity Mirror. Um, sure. Whereas... Public service local broadcasting, i.e. mostly the BBC, has absolutely blossomed during COVID, just as it has done in other crises. And at least that is a structure that can be... So I agree with you that um, Dominic Cummings is right, there is a blob. So James and Dominic Cummings are completely in the same place. They think there is a blob of... Um, Something that I always thought the word liberal was a was a was a was a. Why not, think, why not think of the word centre? Um, well, I don't think he thinks the world's word word centre. I mean, I think you and Dominic Cummings share a view that there is a, a blob which is called the liberal elite. I'm just observing. But, I, okay, go ahead. I'm just observing that you, you and Dominic. Um, you know, have the same have the same view, um, in some ways. Um, and I, I suppose, what I think about public service broadcasting is that it has been attacked uphill and down dale for the last ten years, ten twelve years, and that's never a good. It's never a good, and there has been no opposition. There's really not been any opposition that it could hide behind. Uh, but all of that's remakeable. 
you mean all of that's remakeable? And if I were appointing a director general to the BBC, I'd be looking for an incredibly sophisticated information engineer. I'd be looking for somebody who could who could make a case for taking the BBC into the places it needs to be. So there are declines in youth audiences, all of that kind of thing. Um, so I, uh, but the difference between public service broadcasting and everything else is that it's ours and we can ask to reform it. Sure. You absolutely. can't, you can't, yeah. there's nothing you can, and if yeah. you lose it, you've lost it. Yeah, yeah, so no, I agree. I agree with that completely. That's, yeah. that's, that's all yeah. I would say, really. Um, and on the subject of public service broadcasting, in the past, Professor Seaton, you described the BBC as being a national asset. And in recent years, we've seen a lot of debate about impartiality and whether the BBC is representative, as you just mentioned. Do you believe that the BBC today still serves its purpose? Um, well, I don't think that's... Uh, yes, I, I mean, if you ask me the, just a very brute question, does the BBC, is the BBC reformable? Yes. Could you change it? Yes, it's often been changed quite radically before. Um, is that is that something? I mean, I'd add into the mix something that mostly people don't think of, which is that um, we just shot ourselves in the foot in every conceivable way as a nation, including our what you might call our soft power, which which is some some version of British values like you know, impartiality, which is impossible to deliver, and balance, which is inadequate, and you know, don't get me going. These are all things, and um, uh, the BBC, in a world where any kind of reporting, you know, most of the world in Turkey, India, Pakistan, these are places I go to. I go to Pakistan, India a lot. That. that any the, the, the space in which something can hold anybody to account is shrinking dramatically. It's really dangerous to be a and Africa. It's really dangerous to be a journalist. There's, so the BBC, weirdly, which has still got huge audiences abroad, becomes a, a, a bit which is both a gift to the world, but actually, in some sense, is anchored in some tradition. Which is reformable and good. So I think the BBC, um, for all of its many problems, though I would say that Sally Rooney was quite fun, and um, uh, you know that I think that more or less on the radio has pinned the government statistics to the wall more effectively than all of the fact checkers, time after time after time. Really important program. Um, uh, and certainly local. So I've got a real problem about local news in what being in Wales for this time. I can see that the BBC is not holding the local executive to account at the, in the way that I think it ought to. It's become, a, but I mean, that's all reformable. So I think, yes, the BBC is the best, the best, the best thing we've got in that territory. So don't throw it away and don't, the, the worst thing that's happened in the last, 15, 20 years is whenever the government hasn't liked it, it's launched an inquiry. So if, and change the, change the governance. Um, and if you do that enough, you probably might end up with a frightened BBC. So I, I, but you know, these are never perfect. It's not perfect. I thought, I thought it was deeply responsible for getting Brexit wrong. Um, for two reasons. One of which is the James reason. It wasn't perhaps listening enough. And secondly, it didn't do the key job, which for me is that impartiality doesn't require you to back a lie on the side of a not lie. You know, the BBC, they're always there to say, this is a truth, but these people diverge about it. And I think it failed on that absolutely fundamental interpretation, which I, which I would call hard impartiality, which is you, you can't hide. You just have to say, we think this is true. I, I find myself agreeing with everything that Jean says. <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, you only have to <laughs> very unusual. Only, <laughs> very unusual. I mean, you only have to compare the British press to British public service broadcasting. It's chalk and cheese. I mean, the British press is oh. the least trusted press in yeah. the whole of Europe, with the exception of Macedonia. 
<laughs> British people trust their press less, even than the Serbians trust their press. I mean, we have a really degraded form of journalism. Contrast that with public service broadcasting, which, with all its imperfections, does a very much better job. Um, and it can do an even better job. And yes. we need to help it do so. But, um, you know, it needs to be defended um, Absolutely. strongly. Yeah. I mean, if you look at what's happening now, um, if you look at, you, so the BBC's right up in the approval ratings, been a very important radio listening, hugely increased. BBC's really stepped up to that, the education stuff. You know, of course, it's middle class parents, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's produced amazing educational resources. It's, um, you know, there are bits of, you know, Evan Davis ought to be taken out and sort of, I mean, I know how I would have run that. I mean, Laura Coonsberg and Evan Davis are not right for this moment and could have been dispatched immediately to some, you know, grazing patch for people who have not the right voice for this moment. Leaving all of that aside, the BBC thing. Um, however, the government, um, which apart from being hapless, shambolic, incapable, deceitful, a court um, appointed for cronyism, never ability, having ruthlessly eradicated any kind of, all of those kind of, you know, those obvious things that we all share, um, which is a bit sad because there's a pandemic going on out there, you know. But the, the, the government is still on manoeuvres against public service broadcasting. And, oh. um, and any hope, I mean, I'm surrounded by cheery people who think, oh, there's going to be a lovely new settlement after COVID because people are going to be so nice. If you look at what, for instance, what the government's done over track and tracing, gone to a private firm, not to the state track and tracers who round eight AIDS, I happen to be in a sociology department that when AIDS really bumped up, Mrs. Thatcher understood that AIDS mattered. Scientist, she took it on. She didn't reject it. Morally, she was opposed. And then she took it on. Around AIDS, we developed a fantastic track and tracing. And that the remnants of that are still there in local health, health authorities. Government's not going to them. It's going to private firms. If you look at um, the dole, dole out they've given to Trinity Mirror and Mail, they're still paying off their cronies. Um, and it took COVID to make government ministers go back on the BBC. I mean, this is really an astonishing, a, a literally an astonishing thing to say. So, and Dominic Cummings, who, unless something has happened, is still in there, isn't he? He hasn't, because oh, he can't be sure. abandoned. Yeah. Sure. No. Um, uh, you know, hates journalism and particularly he hates the BBC because it's part of the blob so my view is that you know the BBC has got enormous cuts coming down enormous new round of cuts coming down the, the 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 thing it's going to be trammeled by another set of um uh restrictions about what it can do um instead of saying we have a real information ecology crisis which we obviously do so what instruments have we as a sensible place that will prefer people to be a little bit more rational but we understand they've got emotions instead of saying well we do have this thing called it's called the bbc and public service broadcasting so perhaps actually they'd be better at that during the second world war in the end the government gave up on the bbc and said okay you do it you you know it kept control over news headlines, but it basically said, okay, I think you're better at it than we are. Um, instead of that, which would be, we have a real crisis about information. And the BBC would be an instrument we could use in that crisis. We have very few other instruments around. Instead, the government's pursuing its narrow, politically motivated, malice big vision of a world without any of this public service in it yes and i, I think that's right so maybe the pandemic may de derail that but but there's an alternative right project which is to yeah. Yeah. undermine liberal centers and public yeah. service broadcasting is one liberal center universities are another yeah. and 
they were to be brought to heel. What happens with the pandemic and whether that changes politics is open. But that was the project, clearly, that um, Boris yeah. Johnson and Cummings was. Um, and it's basically a replay of what's happened in America. America. It's American. Uh, 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 yeah. It's American radical right politics. Um, I mean, so we're living in a very... Sorry, go ahead. I mean, there is a lot to be fought for in this moment. Sure. But whether the forces are aligned to do the fighting is one thing. And, yeah, and the, the, there is, um, you know, you know, kill all the normies is, 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 the, is the Cummings motto, really. And I, I wanted to shift to talk about this internet revolution um, in regards to Brexit, because we saw loads of people airing their grievances on social media sites. And Professor Curran, I know that you've been rather sceptical of this idea of the internet democratising news and communication. But don't you believe that these social media sites did allow people to circumvent the traditional media channels and actually spread their own news and take in news that wouldn't traditionally be reported in mainstream sites? Oh, absolutely. Completely, I do. Um, the argument that social media was simply an echo chamber, um, simply um, mm. reinforcing ghettos, which was the standard argument, failed to understand that the internet is constituted on social rather than political mm. lines, that um, all sorts of different friendship groups, social networks, are organised through social media, and they are politically heterogeneous. And when there is politicisation in the community, as there was in 2017, um, a radical project, Corbynism, could find expression on social media when it was demonised in the press and given equal time during the election campaign period by broadcasting, but essentially disparaged before that. So social media was really important, enabling young radical people to speak to each other, but speak to other people as well. So, um, no, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with what you say. But, um, I mean, I mean the, the, one needs a bit of scepticism as well which is that um, clearly the social media are, we're clearly in a, we're clearly in cyber, but we're in a cyber warfare moment in which um, uh, if you look at all of the, a great deal of the material that's been coming in around COVID, around hospitals and so forth, has um, originated in hostile and indeed enemy states. So that the, the capacity, it's a very complicated picture. So, that, so of course, the media, sometimes if you looked at something like anorexia, uh, the, the, the only place to, I always go to anorexia because it's in a way simpler, the only case to sort of deal with anorexic communities is to be online in ways that help them. But many of those anorexic communities actually increase anorexia. That's what they're there to do. And so it's a it's a very sophisticated new information system, but one shouldn't be one shouldn't be ignorant of the fact that the alternative right has used it very very effectively. Probably oh, of, better of than that. Uh, that, I, and I that alien that that, yeah. that enemy states are are are, yeah. are yeah. clearly influencing it. So you know, it, it, um, uh, of course, that, of course, that's right. So social media can spew out hate as well as promoting enlightenment and it can yeah. spew out um, alt-right views as well as radical left views. Um, all that's true. I'm not suggest I'm not signing up to a kind of Silicon Valley view of social media, but it is the case that social media provides an outlet yeah. by by this by bypassing established media that enables some voices to be heard that have been not suppressed but not given much space and that's sometimes good and it's sometimes bad yes, but it's, it, 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 it's, you know, it's a change and when we look at more recent uh, forms of media so such as this a podcast 
YouTube channels and blogging, don't you think the rise of this new media almost challenges the assessment made in your book about power being contained in a small group? I, I, I don't, actually. Um, the reason why I don't is because legacy media have been enormously effective in colonizing cyberspace. Yeah. Um, to repeat what I said before, the most visited news websites in America and Britain and elsewhere are dominated by legacy media. Um, if you look at what Google privileges on its front page, it's very strongly derivative from legacy media. If social media content itself can be influenced by legacy media. So the notion that um, its power is dispersed is, I think, um, mistaken. Indeed, I think in the last edition of Power Without Responsibility, I over-argued that point. Um, it seems to me that we have big leviathans who are wounded, who are bleeding, who are doing their job less well because yes. they're in crisis. But still they have a big shadow, and that big shadow is extended to the internet. I mean, I think there's another thing too, which is about tone and manner, um, which is that the, a to the tone... So you have to go back to Honora O'Neill, perhaps, but um, the, the, a lot of the tone... And that deep down, it may be generation, it may be just like, I find this tone, but the, the tone is one of people who hold rights against some other unknown other who is withholding rights. And that tone is a very, is a very, um, and it's a very difficult tone in which to have, um, to listen to you know, it's not a tone which is meant to be listened to it's a meant it's a tone which is meant to assert a right against somebody who's not giving you what you deserve best and that tone um is very much derived from from the legacy media actually and it's it's a very unhelpful tone to have um useful political discussions in because all it does is and that's where the right has been i think um, I think so interesting in a way. Um, I mean, people, you know, I mean, Brexit was the um, articulation of legitimate, um, legitimate distresses. It was about towns, not cities. It was about little places. I mean, I'm in the middle of Wales, you know, I'm surrounded by little dying towns that used to be noble. Um, they feel resentful about that. They, not so many of them, but um, so I think that the tone in which political discourse is conducted on the social media, which is is very much one of which Asa gets very personal very quickly. I mean, you stick your nose above, and before you know it, you know your gran is blamed, um, um, and it gets personal. Of course, women have been more subject to that. If you look at the uh, attack on somebody like. Suzanne Moore in The Guardian, you know, for views that really challenge some groups' views. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty extreme. Um, so I think both the tone and within that the politics of the tone, which is you're withholding something for me, give it to me, and you're outrageous, um, is very, very inimical to the kinds of discussion that democratic deliberation just has to has to move forward in i, I think that's true and it, it, it's the hectoring tone is actually yeah. very similar to the tabloid press um it's, so it's not it, it's not so new um no. but 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 it's contrasted with public service broadcasting which tries to have some kind of deliberative discourse which relates to evidence and which seeks to establish the truth at, at, at best uh, and um, that discourse we should hang on to my only feeling is that discourse was too exclusive it didn't let enough voices in um, yeah. 
But that's not something that's inherent in public service broadcasting. There have been periods in the 30s, the late 30s and the 60s, when public service broadcasting opened up and allowed lots of voices to be exchanged. Um, so, you know, it, 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 what's been possible in the past should be possible in the future. Um, but, but public service broadcasting has a different kind of discourse from um, social media and the tabloid press. And it's kind of worthwhile to support it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's also about listening. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. And yeah. a lot of social media is about alleging and asserting um, with groups of other people who agree with you. <laughs> um, and, I mean, you know, we all found listening to other points of view uncomfortable and most political decisions, you know, that lots of research about politics has gone on. People, that's how me... I mean, it's perfectly reasonable. People have said, I'm that party. And, you know, that, so people aren't, never have been entirely rational debaters, which is my other argument for public service broadcasting, which is that the particular attack that I can see coming up again, which is, well, the BBC doesn't use, and perhaps we need news, but why does it do all this other stuff? But of course, the answer is the other stuff comedy, drama, uh, you know, satire. Um, does two things that seem to me really important. One of which is that they carry emotions. So the one thing we know about social media is that they are, it's a very emotional venue for saying things. And so that public service broadcasting also deals actually in, in the wider scale with, it has to be in tune with emotions. I mean, it has to, it has to, it, it, it plays with emotions. and. So that makes it feel to me like something that's more pertinent to now because the range of emotions it deals with. I mean, if you looked at, I don't know, Strictly or something, Strictly, I'm not sure, Strictly Come Dancing, which, um, you don't laugh at the contestants, you laugh with them. That's the difference between... It seems to me what the sun would do with it, yeah. and what uh, and actually it's a deeply heartwarmingly taking the taking the Mickey out of yourself. It, 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 there's there's something sort of utterly sort of um, uh, amusing and delightful, but also playing with something that's the opposite of. Because the right is very good at jokes, and, the, and of course the British tabloid press has been very good at jokes. I mean, you know, if you if you laugh at a sun headline, they've got you. Um, and so I think there's something about public services' capacity to investigate feelings, which is. And of course, news is all about feelings too. I completely understand that. But it's. It, if you take like, Gogglebox, Gogglebox strikes yes. me as the perfect illustration of what you're saying. Yes. Um, it's about emotion. It's about different groups saying, yep. um, reacting to a common experience in different ways and being funny um, uh, uh, and taking the mickey, but, but often in an affectionate way. Um, it seems to me to embody a particular image of public service broadcasting, of bringing people together in a common discourse, whereas social media is often about um, putting down the other side. Yeah. Um, and when we look at um, the way social media has been used, let's say, in the Black Lives Matter movement and also the hashtag MeToo movement, what do you think this says about the role social media can play in political activism? Right. I mean, if you take, say, um, Me Too, um, it's had an amazing impact around the world. So um, it, it, over 50 countries have adopted the Me Too movement as a consequence of the internet being global, which is different from most media which is national um and so if you can in sweden for example they had torch lit processions um rallies um 
ministerial endorsements, a change in the law, all in response to the Me Too movement. In Bollywood, there were um, complaints made about sexual harassment, a big national debate taking but there was place. Also, just, there was also the use of Me Too against liberals in JN, in, in, in JNU, which is the main university in India. So it was also, so uh, Seton is ever being difficult. It's been very much used in aspects of India, not in that wonderfully benign way, but to pin enemies, state enemies to the ground. Okay, I, I, I bow to your greater knowledge. All I would say is, yeah, I mean, you know, there, 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 there was a response to the Me yeah. Too movement, which said the following yeah. things. There's a trial by jury via the internet. Um, there's an attempt to um, criminalize for flirtation. Um, there's an attempt to um, allow publicity seekers, narcissists, um, people pursuing personal vendettas. Um, all those comments were available in newspapers like the Daily Mail. But the sheer extent of the protests yeah. established the magnitude of the problem. So yes. I'm sure, of course, that, that any argument can be abused. But what the Me Too movement did is it showed the power of crowds in a global context and it generated a debate about what is acceptable, unacceptable behaviour, which will probably change social norms. So yeah. that is an example, even if there were obviously examples of abuse, where you see social media achieving something that um, is kind of unprecedented. Yeah. You know, the, the, the campaign against slavery um, yeah. took over a, a century to achieve. Yeah. It was facilitated by posts transported by sailing boats, people meeting each other after journeys taking weeks. I mean, in the case of Me Too, um, a million tweets followed. Um, uh, one tweet in the space of one month. There were then two million tweets in January the following year. I mean, just an explosion of collective influence. Yeah. In the case of in the case of um, Black Lives Matters, um, what is striking is how often protests um, have been ignored. Um, when there's been prosecutions of police officers. They've usually got off. Um, and the only exceptions are those which involve visual evidence. When somebody takes a video of what happened, then there's a different outcome. Then there are prosecutions of the police. There are either court settlements. Um, so what the Me Too movement shows is not merely the power of outrage, but the power of moving pictures. Um, so in both those cases, in the case of the first, it's global dimension. And in the case of the second, the power of circulating pictures um, between each other, which is often then taken up by the media. So both those show popular movements enabled by social media. I guess something that I worry about sometimes when I look at social media activism is it's, it's very easy to retweet something or share a post but how does that actually crystallize into a real political movement because it's, it's easy to spread a picture or a video but what are you going to do to actually take action to make sure that some changes it's the, it's the Tahir Square it's the Tahir Square conundrum so you know people went on protesting in Tahir Square but they couldn't make a party out of it but I think that both of the issues that James, both those issues, in a way, require changes in mores. And changes in mores don't need a party. But changes in, if you looked at Black Lives Matter, I mean, I don't, I haven't looked at the American, the American, um, I haven't looked at the breakdown at COVID mortality in America. But early on, it was, it was certainly Black Lives weren't mattering. Uh, 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 you know, the, the, what we've seen here, a quite important debate about um, BAME mortality. 
and actually I think a lot of this, you know, is merging together of different arguments. But I mean, that that would go on. That's a really important. That's obviously a really important issue in America, and I, and it may come to have purchase or it may not. I don't know what's going to happen. So I think that those social mo media movements may be good for changing mores, but there is a sort of if you look at round occupy and things like that, that 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 may have a long impact on political elites, different people. You can see it in the American Senate, different people moving into politics. So there's. Social movements can produce a new generation of politics, but there is nevertheless the Tahir Square thing, which is that Tahir Square ground itself into the ground when it ran out of a public square. It, it couldn't do the organising into a party. And in a way, I think we went through a period when we thought you didn't need parties, but I think we're back thinking they may be very faulty mechanisms but it doesn't look round big political changes if you can do without one, is what I'd say. So mores you can change, probably. It raises a really interesting issue around mores versus political structures. I mean, to, to, to go back to your point, collectivism is a kind of passive activity, but it's also a case that the internet facilitated activism and activism yeah. doesn't always work. It, I, when I yeah. come face with structures of power, it, it can be defeated. But um, there's not much other ways of changing things except by people coming together yeah. to seek change. Absolutely. And often they don't succeed. But um, there is a weapon which people didn't yeah. have before, um, a, an ability to communicate, network, mobilize, um, Build support, reach out to other people. That's it makes political activists more effective. It seems to me, and that's changing public life. Yeah. Uh, now you must you must both be aware of the issues concerning banning controversial voices online. So they've been calls for Facebook and Twitter to almost I don't know if you can call it silencing, but take down a lot of tweets from people like Katie Hopkins and Milo Yiannopoulos and controversial people like this. Do you believe that it's the role of Facebook and other online networks to almost censor these voices out of public discourse? I, ha I have two completely contradictory impulses. I'm opposed to no platforming um, in principle. Yes. I'm opposed to suppressing points of view I don't agree with. Um, the, 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 the issue is, why is Facebook doing this? I mean, why yeah. is this great corporation um, deciding what can be said and heard and not heard, yeah. said and heard? Surely it should be some public body which is yeah. accountable, which operates to public guidelines for the public good. Um, and what is acceptable and what is unacceptable can be debated you know, in, in, in a public place rather than determined by... Uh, a meeting of um, a committee headed by that nice um, Nick Clay. I, 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 I mean, so, I mean, I also agree with James. I'm very opposed to no platforming. I want people to listen to views that they find uncomfortable and awkward. Um, however, um, the traction given to... So if, if you took a, a less, if you took something like um, anti-vaxxing, anti-vaccination movement, which is also a sort of right-wing movement, um, which to my generation is genuinely gobsmackingly astonishing, um, uh, then how you how you deal with I, I, and there's a collective interest because if, if everybody stops vaccinating, then even if I vaccinate my kids, then they won't survive anyway because there'll be too much of the stuff around. Um, so, so I don't have an answer, but I completely think that we need an answer that doesn't allow Facebook and Google to harvest even bigger profits from very nasty untruths than they do from moderating truths. And that seems to me, and I thought the EU proposed legislation, I think Damien Collins has been 
actually rather good on this. Um, I, 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 we really need some view that doesn't leave Elon Musk, you know, delivering our goods and 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 Facebook um, getting richer and richer and richer on 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 destroying the Enlightenment, really. Um, so I, I so I'm well like James. I have no, but I know it has to be a public solution. It probably has to be an international solution, and that that's when you run up against the genuine problems of cyber warfare, actually. And backtracking on our initial discussion about power without responsibility, you spoke about the homogenous nature of the media and the content it puts out. When you look at the media landscape today, do you think that organizations are more willing to take risks in the media that they put out and the talent that they have on screen? Gee, you would know how to answer that. Um, well, you know, what, what, what happens is, what happens is, but well, I don't know what you who you're talking about. I mean, you know, the, the, the Tony Hall, um, who's the current, about to go director general of the BBC, it was very much his personal commitment to try and change what the BBC looked like on screen. And in some ways, I think he's been quite successful at that, um, uh, so that it represented. But th you, you then have a problem, which is, you know, representing is a very complicated job. Um, and you have to do all sorts of other things as well. Um, so, I, you know, you need policies that you need you need a very clear sense of who we, what your publics are and what it is to serve them and um you know all of the evidence that's coming out at the moment is the most for instance educationally underserved group is white working class boys they're 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 the ones that are doing worst at everything so how would the bbc address that you know so i think you just have to take in a great deal of research about your audiences and you have to try and digest that in giving them things that they don't yet know they like and that some of which will fail or offend. Is that, is that, I don't, I've got no answer really. I, I, but, I mean, I, 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 because it's, it's their job. Um, my, my response is we, we need a new media policy initiative. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and uh, one is to set up a, Digital Media Corporation, um, funded by a tax on advertising on Facebook and Google and other um, internet giants. Uh, and its purpose would be to fund um, ventures and voices that serve the public good, whether on the left or the right. Yep. And that would provide new opportunities for um, an opening up of the but media space. Sorry? Was that? I think I'd, I mean, I'd, I, I think I would, so I always worry about governance. Um, but I mean, I agree. I think I would roll it into one of the organisations or I'd roll one of our organisations up into it. You know, I might roll mm -hmm. the BBC up into it. That, because um, one of the things you see so that th the other thing you might just throw into the mixture is that the bits of the bbc's capacity to operate independently have been chopped off and given off to outside things every every time i go to a, a meeting of um children's content producers who are wonderful and what's happened to children's content in britain is terrible because we're very very good at british children's content which then sold all around the world and we happen to be very very good at children's books so there's a sort of synergy around the British imagination and children's books are all public service really they're you know publishing for under 10s is public service it's it's full of morally but, but investment in children's programs has declined yeah, absolutely um, declined yeah. and all of the indie producers have either been sold off or they say they would they'd like the money that the BBC's getting 
And the, the problem is they don't quite understand that if they have it, then the BBC won't have it, and they'll they'll be they'll be. You need something big enough. I'm I'm, I'm very interested, paradoxically, in something big enough to resist and be imaginative, but generous enough to be very inclusive and adventurous. Well, I, and I think those what, are not unrelated qualities. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. And the in, independent production quota um, proved to be a failure um, because it essentially resulted in large American companies yeah. um, forming uh, oligopolies. So it, it didn't create this dynamic, competitive environment. But if you think about Channel 4, um, despite its limitations, Channel 4 seems to me to be a successful project, a way of redefining public service broadcasting. And maybe we come to the point when we should be thinking about doing that again, but not taking the money from the BBC, the very opposite, taking money from a different source. And the internet giants are the obvious source to go to. Yeah. Um, so, so, and, 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 you know, I'm all for defending the BBC to the hilt, but I'm kind of aware of the fact there are problems and the problems could get yeah. greater because the institution under attack tends to be cautious and play safe. It wasn't um, Panorama. Panorama, um, it, what, second week of COVID was so brilliant that the uh, most undistinguished Minister of Culture, who's also responsible for the internet, God help us, um, wrote a quite improper letter. You know, so that's not, that's, that's, I mean, you know, there are, there are only, uh, I can only think of three letters. Two of them have been issued by this bloody government. Yeah. And I'm all in favour. I'm, I'm, I'm a far more conservative person than James. So I would want the government to come out of all of this well. I would want them to be steering us through COVID. Um, uh, uh, I want a proper opposition. I certainly think we need new policy. But um, I don't think that the BBC has been without a kind of adventurousness which you need to feel a bit secure about. And, of course, I defend Channel 4. And actually, at the moment, I think LBC is, is you know, is almost reinventing the great days of LBC when it was first set up as a public service radio broadcaster. I think it's at that thing yeah. for... Yeah. Yeah, I think it's doing brilliantly. So mm -hmm. I want to keep public service revenues. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. Um, I, I, I agree with that. I'm you know, not disagreeing. Yeah. No, and I'm not. I'm not against. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying the BBC or it's just without the B, the BBC is always the one. It's really interesting. People don't explain to me, James, why people don't get absolutely furious that their mail has done the wrong thing. The only oh, people who don't like the mail are people who don't like the mail. Whereas, and it, 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 whereas you don't get mail readers saying, how dare you be, I mean, is that because they're so good at being in touch with their readers? Um, so what's going on? Whereas BBC people, everybody hates BBC. Um, well, I, 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 I think... The BBC is in a situation that it was in the late 70s. Yeah. Um, uh, in a polarizing society, it's really difficult to be a good broadcaster um, because you're going to be got at by the left and the right. Um, There's no And um, essentially that happened. That's what produced Channel 4, of course. It was a reaction to attacks of the BBC. Uh, and... Um, the same thing could happen again, um, and, and and that would be deeply depressing because the BBC will be under really serious attack, and there won't be people rallying round to defend it um, in the way they should. But um, it doesn't stop us from thinking about creative alternatives outside the umbrella of the BBC. Thank you for joining me on Telefriend.